Amen. Good to see you out tonight to our Sunday evening service. And I tell you what, been a beautiful day. And uh, appreciate everybody who was out this morning. Appreciate those of you that made your way back tonight on Sunday night. Good to see Ann and Grace out with us tonight. Well, I tell you what, I, I told them, I just love those ladies. and appreciate them so much for coming out and being a part of our church. And, and God bless you. So we're going to get started up tonight and uh, get ready to have some prayer requests here just in a minute. And got a few things we need to mention about that. And then uh, we'll get right into the message. But let's stand and do a song tonight. Do corporate singing tonight. What are we going to do? Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's all stand and loosen up if we can't stand. If you can't stand. Sit. Sit. Probably. She said, he said, no, she is not. So uh, they, they'll be stopping and see uh, Stacy's mom lives in, what was it, Ga is it Gainesville? Yes. Gainesville, I believe. And they will be staying there for a couple of days and then heading on down here. But excited about seeing him. And uh, we appreciate Sebby and Stacy and their family. Continue to pray for them and with their daughter and their granddaughter, what they're going through with, with, with that situation. But also pray for uh, Darlene Stokes sent a message in this morning on, online, and I didn't get it uh, while we were having service, but her uncle, Charles Cleghorn, is having a, a heart valve re repair surgery tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, pray for Charles, and then her Aunt Patty Burdick is in the hospital with leukemia, mm -hmm. and they're searching for a bone marrow transplant donor for her. So pray for those, and, and remember Darlene and her family as they go through that. Darlene just retired and uh, so that's exciting so pray for them pray for leanne and her family as they're battling this sickness connie mccartney sent me a message said they watched the program today thanking us for the prayers that she's got to be having that i forget what i, I they used to call it like a basket or something they put in there to catch blood clots i don't know what the official term is but pray for her 
pray for Bella Hall, that little two-year-old great-granddaughter, my preaching buddy, Roland Cook, who uh, needs surgery to help her talk, and then with Bill's sister and Shirley's sister, pray for them, and then all those on our prayer list tonight. So we've got a lot of folks that we need to pray for, a lot of folks that have been sick, a lot of folks that have got to do whatever's going around, and just pray that uh, God will continue to bless us and help us. Excited to take in our new members this morning. Uh, Miss Clinton, boy, I just love her. She's been with us for so long. And what a good woman. And then Stephen and, and Vivian, and you get a chance, if you haven't had a chance to really get up close to them, get up close to them and visit with them. And well, they are, wow, they're such good people. And uh, we just thank God, thank God for that. The church is growing and going and pray that uh, we got that meeting. Hopefully we'll have that meeting Friday with the city and uh, get get uh, some type of uh, direction on which way to go with our addition out here that it'll they'll, they'll give us something that more than what we've got just from going here to there, here to there. It's kind of like a yo-yo back and forth, but hopefully Friday we'll get uh, some type of uh, uh, decision or, or word that will give us the uh, okay to begin to start. Amen. And don't forget our, our building fund, uh, working on that, trying to get that built up so when we go, Amen. we'll be ready to go and be ready to get started on that. So we've got a lot of things going on. We're excited about that, excited about what God's doing. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, man, it's exciting. It's exciting being in the ministry. You know, and, and I, I, say, I say that obviously from my point, but you're in the ministry too. Right. Remember how many people, remember, see if you can remember this, how many people are ministers? Everybody. Everybody. Everybody's got a ministry. Everybody's got a gift. It's just our job to discover our gift, and then what's the next deed? It's you develop our gift and then to deploy. deploy it and if you don't it will lay dormant and we all did pretty good on that huh well i, I, I was just thinking we've had all these uh this influx of all these new people coming in being saved and, and coming in with us we need to start that lesson over again but uh you haven't forgotten it yet so we're gonna pray now major are you ready to pray yes, sir a new shirt man well, thank you for telling everybody. <laughs> nice looking shirt, isn't it? Hey, no, it's yeah, it. Man, I like it. just haven't seen it. Sharks, fish, I like it. Man. All right, man. Good to see everybody out this evening. Uh, it's a wonderful, beautiful day here. Glad we're back in the Lord's house. Amen. 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 Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come today with thankful hearts, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be back in your house yet again, dear Lord. Lord, we thank you for the service that we had, dear Lord. Pray that uh, help us to be be mighty men, Lord, and mighty women for you, Father, and help us to uh, to protect our feet, past, dear Lord. And uh, and we can only do it through by you and by your power, dear Lord. And help us to, to always remember that, dear Lord, and always focus and keep the main thing, the main thing. Dear Lord, I ask that you'd uh, bless the service tonight, Lord. Thank you for the singing, Lord. Thank you, Miss Jean. What a beautiful job she did this morning, as always, dear Lord. Thank you for her. Thank you for Miss Ruth, dear Lord. And thank you for all those that help out, dear Lord, back in the children's church and in the nursery and in the sound booth, dear Lord. We just uh, love and appreciate everybody, dear Lord, and uh, everything that everybody does, Lord, to make this church possible, make it happen, dear Lord. I ask that you continue to bless them, dear Lord, to continue to bless our church. Lord, we thank you for the souls we've seen saved, dear Lord, and thank you for... All, that, uh, all the growth that we've seen, dear Lord, we praise you for that, dear Lord. And Lord, I want to pray a special prayer for a meeting coming up here on Friday, dear Lord. And ask that you'd uh, give us uh, more wisdom, Father, help, you know, help us to be good stewards, dear Lord, because uh, this is in our church, Lord, this is your church. Amen. We just want to be good stewards, Lord, and take care of what you've given us, dear Lord. And pray that you'd give us direction, that you'd give us unity, Lord, and give us uh, give us uh, the, 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 the peace, Lord, to know what you want to do, dear Lord. And pray that you'd keep Sebi. Uh, Sebi and uh, Stacy say, because they travel down, dear Lord, be a blessing to have them, dear Lord, and uh, uh, we continue to pray for his health, dear Lord, and I uh, just want to pray for the prayer list, dear Lord, and all those that were mentioned, Lord, and that won't, weren't mentioned, dear Lord, continue to be with mom, how she's not feeling good, dear Lord, not here with us yet, dear Lord, just bless her, and uh, all the others, dear Lord, that are, that are out there sick, dear Lord, with, with the stomach stuff going around, and, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, whatever else is uh, out there, dear Lord, I ask you should to reach down and touch their knees, dear Lord, be with them, and help them able to get back in your house, dear Lord. And uh, Father, we just uh, want to pray for the, the, the message, dear Lord, as you uh, you put on Dad's heart, dear Lord, as you fill him up with the Holy Ghost, dear Lord, help us that we put, across, put away any distractions, dear Lord, for the next uh, this next hour, dear Lord, help us to dedicate this time to you, Father, because it's, it's all your time, dear Lord, but to help us just to, uh, to, to take, take good care of it, Lord, and to be good stewards of the time that you've given us, dear Lord, and not be able to open up our hearts and minds to the message that you, that you put on Dad's heart, dear Lord. And again, we praise you for all the things that happened, dear Lord, and and everything happens, Lord, we give you all the glory and honor for it, dear Lord. Nonetheless, it's not our will, but that your will be done. In the holy, sweet, uh, sweet, precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, buddy. You feel like I'm back in school. You know, when you're in school, when you couldn't go into a classroom or go down the hall or go, go anywhere if you had a new shirt on or a new pair of pants or a new pair of shoes or a booger on your face or your hair messed up or a pimple on your nose or something. Most kids would be, oh, they pointed out, buddy, right off the bat. So, this is not a brand new shirt. It's been in the closet for a couple weeks. <laughs> But first time you've seen it, right? First time that you have seen it. We got your Bible tonight. Open up the book of Revelation, chapter number two. Book of Revelation, chapter number two. I'm going to try to do something tonight I've been trying to do since back in March. And that's finished my final thoughts on the seven churches of Revelation. And uh, I look forward to getting our internet. That's one another thing we need to pray for. Amen. Is getting that internet when we get started back. I want to get started back on the book of Revelation on Sunday night. But I want to wait. Until we can get back uh, on on the uh, line with the hard line the internet with yes. our own internet instead of the MiFi, the MiFi hanging on, but it's, it just mm -hmm. comes and goes. Right. And uh, so pray about that. But uh, pray that uh, this week we're supposed to be here. But they said since the message, what was that, Friday or Thursday? Thursday, right. Friday. They said it might might. They said they'd be in touch with us in the next couple of days. But it, it did sound encouraging to me. But uh, maybe, it, maybe it will be. Amen? Amen. If you're taking notes tonight, I hope you take a couple of notes. I'm going to give you the, try to get through these seven churches and, and try not to review much, but just review a little bit. You probably don't remember where we stopped. And uh, I do because I have a mark. That's the advantage I have. But I'm going to give you a P, a, a, a word that starts with a P for each of the seven churches. If you're ta taking notes on that tonight. But. Let me go back and talk about those seven churches for just a minute. You know the seven churches of Revelation are mentioned in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. After you get into chapter 4, the church is not mentioned again. No. Right. And there's a reason for that. Yeah. The rapture of the church happens at the end of the church age. Right. Now the church age has been going for about 2,000 years. And, uh, you know, it could close at any moment. Amen. Nothing, let me say it again, nothing has to happen. There's no prophecy that, that has to happen before the rapture of the church. You say, well, what about all these things that people say have to happen before Jesus comes back? You need to realize the rapture and the return are two different events. Amen. The rapture is the next scheduled event on God's prophetic time clock, and there's nothing that has to happen before that happens, and Jesus comes to take us out. It could happen today. Right. Right. could happen before we get home. Yes. It could happen at any moment. It may not happen for another hundred years. Who knows? Right. But as we look at the Bible and look at these seven churches, there's a, there's, a, there's a pattern in those churches that shows us where we are on that timeline. If we, if we took over here and said this was the beginning of the church age, this wall, and this wall over here was the rapture of the church, We'd be over there closer to the rapture of the church than where the major is sitting. Right. I mean, we're right up against it. We're bumping that timeline. That's how close we are. Right. You so you said that no, it's stupid, it's silly, it's crazy to set dates. Nobody knows the date. Right. Nobody right. knows the day or the hour. But Jesus did give us enough information to know the times, Amen. to know the seasons. Right. And so when we look at those things, we realize that wow, it has to be pretty close. I was talking to one of my friends this week. And we were just talking about basically the same thing. I, I, you know, I guess, I guess probably when you were kids and your parents and your grandparents, I guess every generation thinks that that's the worst generation it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Or you know how you know you're facing. I, I face things in my generation that you probably didn't. That maybe Bill and Bill or somebody a little bit old, maybe you didn't face in your generation. And then the major come along, and in his generation, they're facing things in his generation that I didn't face in my generation. Right, right. And then I got my grandkids coming along, and God help them. They're, going, they're facing stuff that right. you and I never even imagined. But I, I can't imagine, I, honestly, I can't imagine how much farther into sin we can go. I don't know how much lower we can sink. Amen. I don't know how much more depraved we can get than what we are. We're on a downward spiral. Yeah. Right. So I do believe that the coming of the Lord for the rapture church is very near. Amen. We'll look at those seven churches. Let me go back and tell you there's three ways we look at those. Right. Yeah. One is a practical way. Amen. 
Those seven churches were seven real churches. By the way, what were their names? Every singer plays the songs pretty loudly. Remember that? Every say it with me. Every singer plays the songs pretty loudly. He said, well, Pastor, I've never read those names of those churches. Well, that's just a, an acronym to remember those churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So when you think about that, every singer plays a song pretty loud. If you can remember that, you can probably get the names of those seven churches. But they, those seven churches, number one, they were practical churches. They were real churches. They were in Asia Minor. They were, there, was a, there was a way that they were laid out there. There was a way that they were laid out in the Bible. There was a, a, an order to the way God gave them, the way Jesus gave that revelation to John, the way he wrote them down. They had real pastors. They had real people. They were real churches, just like Freedom Baptist Church. Not only were they practical churches, there's a personal application to each one. Every one of those churches has something in them that every Christian throughout the last 2,000 years of the church age could apply to their life. There's either warnings, things we need to heed, things we need to do, things we need to repent of, things we need to be watching out for, things that we need to do. That in every church is, is, is in every one of those are personally applicable to you and I in our Christian life. Amen. And then there's also the third P that we talked about is prophetically. Those seven churches represent that timeline from the beginning of the church age 2,000 years ago until the rapture of the church. Now we've lived and we've seen history, you know, if you would have been, if you'd have been there in 96 AD, you couldn't have seen that. Right. You wouldn't have had a clue about the prophetic picture. But we, 2,000 and years later, on this end of the timeline, we turn and look back and we can see how those churches have fallen into that timeline. Amen. Let me give them to you tonight real quick and just review these seven churches. Ephesus was the first church. That was a passionless church. Remember what the problem was? What's the warning we need to take away from them? Oh, they had a lot of good things. It was the church of the apostles. It was the first century church. I mean, it had... Can you imagine having John maybe as the pastor of the church, John the Revelator as the pastor, having, having all these apostles that would have been involved in that. They had all the right doctrine. They had all the right teaching. They, had, they, had, they didn't tolerate false teaching. They had so many good things going for them. But as time went on, they lost their passion. Well, they didn't lose it. They left it. The Bible says you've left your first love. And let me just say to you now, the warning we need from the church of Ephesus is get your love life right with Jesus and everything else will fall into place. Amen. The problem we have, the reason we have trouble in a Christian life is because we're just not in love with Jesus enough. Right. If you love Jesus the way you ought to love him, everything else will fall into place. Amen. We have skirmishes and we have pettiness and we have division and we have... Uh, animosity and we have hurt feelings and we have all these things that happens in churches because we're just human most of that happens because we're not really in love with Jesus right. if we were really in love with you, your best advice I can give you fall in love with Jesus yes. and if you say well I, I've already fallen in love well fall in love with him again Amen. I've been married 45 how, how old are you made? 43. Huh? 43. you'll be 44 I've been married 45 years that's a, I've not got good clarification on that. <laughs> and uh, 45 years. And, uh, you know, I've had, to, I've had to fall in love over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know, I'm not like the old guy that got married. And, you know, his wife said, well, they've been married 50, 60 years. And she said, well, honey, you never tell me you love me. He said, I told you when we got married. <laughs> he said, if I ever changed my mind, I'll let you know. That's Bill Maher. That's sure to, <laughs> sure to just be sure just so punched on old Bill. I know, I know exactly what she was telling me. She just punched on Bill, just whispering that in his ear. Bill, just go ahead and tell her right now you love her and get that thing out of the way again. You'll be, you'll be good for another 40 or 50 years. But, you know, that's the way a lot of people are. I told, I told you when we got married, I loved you, and that was enough. But that's not enough. You need no. to continue. Listen, to have a good marriage, you need to continually fall in love over and over and over Amen. again. Amen. And it's the same way with Jesus. So we need to learn from the church of Ephesus that we need to fall in love with Jesus again. Amen. And Amen. then we had the church of Smyrna that come along. That was the second century church. And that church was the time of severe persecution. Right. And we learned it was the persecuted church. And we learned from the church of Smyrna that 
A lot of this stuff that's on TV and a lot of stuff that we hear today is false teaching, false doctrine. They say, well, if you're a good Christian, if you're Christian enough, or if you're, you, you know, if you've got enough faith, that you're never going to have problems, you're never going to have heartaches, you're never going to have disappointments. Nobody's ever going to be sick. You'll never be without a job. You'll never be without money. You'll never, you'll never stump your toe or anything like that. Well, we know that's a lie because you go back and read. Do you realize there have been millions and millions and millions of Christians who have been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. And for somebody stand up and say, well, you know, if you're a good enough Christian, you'll never have any trouble. That's false. Yes. I, I refute right. that. The Bible refutes that. So from the church of Smyrna, we learned that everybody's going to have problems. Then we got to the church of Pergamos. The church of Pergamos was the polluted church. It came along It came along on this timeline after the first church and the apostolic church and then the persecuted church. We get to the church of Pergamos and it, it was a, a polluted church because Constantine was the emperor of Rome. And they had just been martyred. Remember, they used to put Christians on a stake and burn them to light their gardens at night. Yeah, right. History says that they fed so many of them in, in, into the Colosseum, into the wild animals, that the wild animals foundered themselves and no longer wanted to eat human flesh. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Constantine comes along and sees this sign in the sky, looks like a cross, and he says, hey, I'm converting over to Christianity. So when he converted over, everybody converted over. He brought the church in. The church used to be without buildings. It used to be underground. It used to be out there hidden in the caves and the rocks and in houses and places like that. And then Constantine said, oh no, we're going to build you elaborate buildings. We're going to bring you in and we're going to make the state religion, mm. Christianity. Well, it become polluted because we learn, we learn from the church of Pergamos the danger of, of compromise. Right. Wow. And we haven't learned that yet because we're still compromising with the wrong things and with the wrong people. The Bible says to be not unequally yoked. The Bible says come out from among them and be ye separate. And uh, we, we've forgotten all those exhortations that the Bible has given us, but that's what happened with the church of Pergamos because... You know, here one day they're killing people for being a Christian. The next day they're killing you if you're not a Christian. Mm. So it's when they joined up, stayed in church, joined up together, never worked, never has, never will. Amen. Church is a separate entity from the state. And, you know, thank, thank God for our Constitution. It gave us in the First Amendment to right to have freedom of religion, although they've changed that because Thomas Jefferson wrote to a church and was giving them the assurance that they would not interfere in church activity. But boy, I tell you what, wow! Yeah. They sure interfere with church activity. And then we come with the church of Thyatira, and that was the perverted church. The church of Thyatira was the church after, after the combining of the, the state and, and Christianity under Constantine, and as it continued on, it got worse and worse and worse, and the Roman Catholic Church was formed out of that. And for a thousand years, they ruled the world. And the Roman Catholic Church ruled them for a thousand years. A lot of false ideas, a lot of false doctrine came into the church during that time, and we need to be on guard today. we got a lot of false doc doctrine today. we got a lot of false ideas today that people are bringing into the church. Not Bible, not Bible. So we need to be careful about false doctrine. That's the lesson we learn from them. And then we get into the Sardis church, which was the church of the Reformation, who really rescued the gospel out of the hands of, of, of Roman Catholicism back then because of the popes. You know, they were fighting and arguing and, and had the indulgences and had all these things and all this stuff that was going on. It was not Bible. And the Protestant Reformation really rescued the gospel out of them. But the Sardis church was opposing church. They were they were a church it was a church in name only. I mean they were Jesus they got a name but you're dead. And man when you look at when you look at that church age in the in the history of the world, I mean man I thank God for the for the Reformation. I thank God that we got away from some of that stuff and, and I thank God for the people that let them out. Martin Luther on October thirty first, fifteen hundred and seventeen, he not, he nailed ninety five things, tenets that he had against the Roman Catholic Church on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany and walked away. That started the Protestant Reformation. Thank God for that. You had what they call, have you ever heard this term? You had a couple people even before Martin Luther. They called them the morning stars of the Reformation. You ever heard that term? The morning stars of the Reformation. One of them was John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was one of the guys who, who began to disagree with the popes about what they were doing. So man, that's not right. John uh, 
John Wycliffe, Wycliffe, whatever way you want to say that, believed that the Bible was the sole authority for the faith and practice, and he believed what the Bible said. Amen. So he got into it with, with the Catholics and with the priests, and, and they called him the morning star of the Reformation because he lived from about 1330 to 1384. In fact, they were going to kill him. They would have burned him at the stake, but he died, and as he was, as he was speaking, he died before they could burn him at the stake. They hated him so bad. That 30 some years after his death, they dug up his bones and burned them and threw them in the river because they believed, they believed if they could dig your bones up and burn them, that you wouldn't be fit for the resurrection. And threw them in the river and let them just wash all over the place. But Martin Luther, I'm Martin Luther, John Wycliffe is the guy who translated the Latin. Remember, Catholic Church was in Latin. They, they were using the Latin Vulgate, their, their mass was in Latin. And John Wycliffe, he wanted everybody to have a Bible. He's the first English translation of the Bible. He translated out of the Latin Vulgate. So there were some issues and some problems with that. But at least he wanted everybody to have a Bible. Amen. Remember the Catholic Church, you didn't have a Bible. No. The priests, the popes had the Bible. Yeah. They told you what was in the Bible or what they wanted you to believe in the Bible. But Wycliffe believed that everybody ought to have a Bible. And by the way, if you know anything about Wycliffe, that started a, you know, that's been a big Bible translating organization for years and years and years. And then you had another guy who was in, a, like they call, maybe some people call a morning star of the revolution, was John Huss. And he lived from 1372 to 1415. He picked up on what, what Wycliffe was saying, what Wycliffe was teaching about the, the authority of the scriptures and began to preach that. By the way, when Wycliffe died, they burned his books. Mm. you got to realize, burning books back then, not like burning books today, that was before the Gutenberg press. printing press. Books were a bit, would have been handwritten. Mm. And they, they burned his books to try to get rid of them. But John Huss had picked up on that and picked up and followed right along. And he was a Catholic priest too. And he got into it with the Catholic Church and said, no, that's not right. So let's stop your teaching. It's not right. It's false doctrine. And uh, man, they took him and they burned him at the stake. Mm -hmm. So you, I want you to realize that there have been a lot of people throughout the history of the church age that, that have died that's given their life that you and I could be here today. Amen. We've got that freedom today. We've got a Bible today because of that. Amen? Amen. And when you think about that, man, listen, wow. And then Martin Luther, man, was, you, you think about that. Wycliffe influenced John Huss. John Huss influenced Martin Luther. Martin Luther influenced those other guys, Zwingli and Erasmus and some of those early guys of the Reformation. And they started the Re Reformation. He pulled out. You say, well, then what, what was wrong with the Re Reformation? They only pulled out so far. It become, after a while, it become a dead orthodoxy. It become just a dead, dry formalism. By the way, we're still battling that today. Yeah. There are churches today that they, they have absolutely no, no power of God. They have no unction of God. They have no anointing of God. They have no emotional uh, from the Spirit of God that moves them and stirs them and excites them. It's just like, go, it's like going to a classroom lecture. Mm. By the way, people say going to church is like a classroom lecture. I don't like that. I don't like that. Church ought to be alive and real. Amen? Amen. Amen. So when you think about Wycliffe and, and John Huss, these guys were like pre-reformers. And then 102 years later, after, after Huss had died, Martin Luther nailed his tenets on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany, and walked away. And, you know, they, all these guys, they gave them a chance to recant. You know, they pull them into their councils and their meetings and tell them, you know, if you recant, if you take back, and you say you're sorry, and no, we're not, we're not, we're not going to do it. Which bothers me. It bothers me because I'm, I don't see that same commitment. Mm -hmm. I don't see that shaman right. commitment that I talked about this morning a lot in churches today. And you know, if it comes to America, I don't know if, the, I don't know if Christians in America are willing to take a stand on that and die for their faith. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to get them out to church. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Hard enough to get them to live right. right. That's true. That's true. What's going to happen, and if you heard me Wednesday night talking about cultural Marxism, what's going to happen if persecution, well, it's not if, it's already happened. Yes. If it continues to get worse in America, the church has to go underground, and they start, they start killing Christians for what they believe. You say, preacher, you believe that could happen? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. 20, 30, 40 years ago, I believe it would happen way down the road. 
I believe it happened long after I was dead. I didn't believe, it, I didn't believe I'd ever see it. But we're seeing it today. So we learn from the church of, of Sardis, man, that you can, you, 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 know, you can have a name that you're dead. And we got a lot, go up down the road, their church is everywhere, church is everywhere you go. Most of them are dead on a hammer. Yeah, right. Most of them are dead, dead, dry, dusty, dry as last year's bird's nest, dry as a cracker box. I mean, man, absolutely no power to have enough power to blow the fuzz off a peanut. They wouldn't get excited. They wouldn't get worked up. They wouldn't get stirred up. They wouldn't be passionate about anything. And I say, wow, think about that. Just nominal Christians. Right. Yes. You know what it means to be a nominal Christian? Be a Christian in name only. Mm -hmm. And then we got to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 7. This was the passionate church. You say, what did we learn from this church, Pastor Moore? But from this church, we learned, we learned that, man, we still ought to be soul winning, we ought to have evangelistic campaigns, we ought to have revivals, we ought to be missions and missionary minded and, and all that stuff. That's what happened after after the dead, dry orthodoxy of the, the, the Protestant Reformation as it began to wind down, man, then all of a sudden these revival fires began to spring up. Amen. George Whitfield. Wow. I talk about George Whitfield. I just love that guy. Amen. Man could preach in an open field. said you could hear him for a mile away without amplification. Preaching to his voice, with his, his throat would bleed. Preach that hard. And I think about, I think about, uh, uh, why I'm a mind one. Like, who's a guy that preached sinners in the hands of an angry God? Help me, sinners in the hands of an angry Jonathan Edwards. You know, one of the, they say one of the greatest minds probably ever to grace America. Back in the early Great Awakenings. And you, and you had those guys that come along. You had the D.L. Moody's. You had the John, the, 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 the Methodist guys, John. Wesley. John Wesley. John Wesley and Charles Wesley. You had those guys come along. I and mean, you had all these great, great evangelists to come up, man. And, I, you know, I mentioned some of them a couple of Wednesday nights ago. Hardly anybody knew any of these in the last hundred years. But, I mean, these guys were back there. You had the Charles Spurgeons. You had those guys that were preaching, man, that were shaking the world, man. And, and I mean, I mean, revival fires. You had the revival in Wales in 1906, 1904, 1905, 1906. Man, where they, they said everywhere was in revival. I remember hearing the story that a preacher from, from, from America took him and his deacon board over there and they got off the plane, got there, got there, and they said, where's the revival? They said, it's everywhere. They said, it's everywhere. They said, in fact, they're meeting down at the schoolhouse right now. They were having a revival at the schoolhouse. Everybody said, man, listen, so many people got saved. Coal miners got saved. Had to retrain the mules. Mules pulled the coal out of the coal mine, man, on, on, with buggies. And they were used to being cussed and talked to so bad and so filthy. When those coal miners got saved, the mules didn't know what they were talking about. They had to retrain them. Amen. That's revival. Amen. Think about Billy Sunday. It had a revival, man, up in Allegheny County, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands and thousands of people were saved. Amen. Shut down bars and clubs and saloons and had to build new churches. Revival. Amen. That's what came out of the Philadelphia church age. Amen. It showed us missionaries. We begin to send missionaries all across the world. I talked about this morning, David Livingston. I talked about some of those guys. Man, listen, missionaries begin to be sent out. Let me just say that. I believe that's one reason that God has still kept his hand on America. Amen. Amen. America has probably sent out more missionaries and, and given more money to missionary efforts than all, maybe every other country combined in the world. Amen. I think that pleases God. Amen. I think that pleases God. So we've learned through the church of, of Philadelphia, man, that, that, by the way, Philadelphia means brotherly love. And uh, that we learn from them that we ought to, by the way, that church is going to continue on. They're going to be a remnant part of that church going to continue right on into the rapture. Because we got to, we got the Philadelphia Church, and we need to, we need to continue to be man. Thank God that we're we're evangelistic. I was talking to Stephen back there. You know, I said I said Sebi's coming to town next week. He, I said, man, Sebi is an evangelist. He said, you're not. I said, well, the Bible says do the work of an evangelist. Now, but Sebi's an evangelist, and uh, man, I tell you what, I'm excited about Sebi to get here. But man, we all ought to do the work of an evangelist. Amen. We all ought to be soul winning. We all ought to be so conscious. We all ought to get us the gospel track and, and give it to somebody and hand it out to somebody 
and share it with somebody and want to use their Facebook and their social media to get the gospel out. Not run our neighbors down. Right. Amen. Not support Anheuser Bush. Amen. Not support Target. Amen. Not fly our gray, gray flags over, but want to use their social media, man, to get the gospel out and let people know that Jesus loves them. Amen. And can save them. Amen. See, they use they see they, they use the same terminology that we use. Love and acceptance and tolerance, but it's not. No. It's not. When they, when, hey, listen. When the, when the door shuts on America, and it's shutting right now. Can you hear the cracking, the, the squeaking of the doors? It's going shut. When that door shut, your voice will no longer be a voice. Right. You will no longer be heard. Right. They will shut down. They will shut down. They will shut down. Every voice that opposes anything that they think is right. That's why we today, that's why, man, there's an urgency. There should be an urgency to get our people saved. Amen. We should be going right back into this Philadelphia church age, the Philadelphia church, and we ought to be, man, listen, we ought to be having revival. We ought to be having missionary efforts. We ought to be having evangelistic campaigns. We ought to be doing everything we can to get people saved before it's everlasting too late. Because once it's shut, I'm just going to say this to you tonight. Listen, if we live to see America go down, it will not come back in our lifetime. Right. And it won't come back in our lifetime. It won't come back. It won't come back. No. Once it goes, once it goes under. You say, Chris, you really believe that, don't you? Yeah. Absolutely, I really believe that. Absolutely, I really believe that. Cultural Marxism has, has taken over our culture to a point of where any dissenting. You, listen, they talk about free. There's not free speech. There's only free speech if you want to talk what they want to talk about. We want to talk about the Bible. We want to talk about Jesus. We want to talk about one way to heaven, only being saved by the blood of Jesus. But there's no free speech in that. That's right. You want to tell people that they can be saved? They want you to believe the lie about all these genders, all these 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 types of genders out there. They want you to believe that lie, but yet they don't want anybody to tell the truth of what the Bible says where God said there are two genders. Right. They don't want you to tell them. They don't want, they don't want people to be told the truth because they want people to die lost. And go to hell. And man, we're we're living in we're living in we're living in perilous times. We're living in a good age to be a Christian. Amen. To let our light shine, you don't have to have a real bright light. Amen. It's so dark. You don't have to have the bright. You don't you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the box. Right. You can have a dim bulb and still shine pretty good in this day and age. Amen. But we need to be like the Philadelphia Church, and we need to continue on. And, and, and being evangelistic and being soul winning and inviting people out to church. Man, listen, every week, as I said this morning, can you, can you, you realize what a blessing it is that we've had visitors in our church every Sunday since the first of year, the year? Amen. I don't know how many weeks that is, but we're in the sixth month of the year. I can tell you that. And man, we've had visitors, we've had a visitor sometime on Sunday, every Sunday Amen. since the first of January. You realize, I don't, I've never been to a church that's had that. I'm waiting on an answer. Amen. I ain't never been to a church that's had that. Amen. Never been to a church that had visitors week after week after week after week after week. We need to continue to work. We need to continue Amen. to work. There's a whole Amen. bunch of people out there that's not going to church anymore. Yep. Right. There are probably people in your family and your friends that are not going to church anymore. They need to be in church. Amen. Amen. Right. We need to be saved. So we need to be passionate. We need to be passionate. Yes. We need to be, listen, I'll put up the foolishness, but I'm, I try to be passionate. I try to be loving. I try to be kind to tell people they, they have a hope. Yes. Amen. You know, the reason he, the reason all these people are depressed and disillusioned is because they don't see any hope. That's right. We got, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing young adults, this, this group is mixed up in this confused gender committing suicide at an alarming rate. Amen. Amen. They want to blame people like me for it. No, it's not my fault. Amen. It's your fault. Their fault. That's telling them that lie that there's no hope that they were born like that, that they can't get out, that they're trapped in that lifestyle. You're not trapped in that lifestyle. Amen. You're not trapped in sin. Right. Jesus died to save you from any sin. He saved anybody. Right. They don't want to hear that. And why don't why don't people want to hear the truth? Right. Wow. So we learn from the church of Philadelphia that we need to we need to be passionate. Amen. And then we move into the last church. I know you didn't think I'd get there, did you? 
I'm there early too. Move into the last church, the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia, the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church is the prideful church. Remember what they said? Remember what they told Jesus? We're rich and increased with good and have need of nothing. Jesus said, really, you, you don't really know how bad off you are. He said, you're poor, blind, wretched, and naked. He said, you, man, listen, you think you've got it all, but you have nothing. I want you to just think for just a minute. Stop for just a minute. Just think. Let your mind wander. About church buildings and churches that you've known down through your lifetime. They might be the, that might be the, that might be the most beautiful church. They might have the most beautiful buildings. They might have the most beautiful. Grand. And listen, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't get wrapped up in that. Right, right. right. We can pitch a tent out here and have church right out there. Amen. And just right. flip the switch. I could go right out there and preach underneath that tree just as good as I could right here. Yep. Amen. When we were down at Mayberry, I I loved it. it was, you couldn't stand the heat, but I loved it. <laughs> preach the sweat just pouring off of your face, blood. I loved it. Amen. I loved tent meeting, camp meeting style preaching. I love it. Amen. We don't need the buildings. We don't need all that. We need to pay our gods what we need. Amen. Amen. But the Laodicean church didn't have that. Right. They got to a place where they were rich and increased with good. They had so much pride about them, they didn't realize how bad off they are. You know what pride will do? It will deceive you. Right. It will blind you. Think of, think of, I don't know if we've got any rich people in here tonight or not. Maybe if we do, God bless you. <laughs> but most rich people don't think, think they need anything. Yeah. It's hard to talk to people who've got uh, half a million dollar homes, million dollar homes, two or three million dollar homes, two or three boats, houses on every coast, and, and houses up in the mountains, and, and every kind of vehicle in the, in the driveway, and, and a bank account that's just running over, and, and, and their 401ks and retirements just run, And you tell them, maybe you need the Lord, they just look at you like, like a goose in a hailstorm. That's right. That's why I like, that's why I like preaching to poor folk. Yeah. yeah. Poor folk understand it, man. Yeah, I need something. Yes. They, they don't have that pride. Amen. Rich people can be saved. Yes, yes. But they got they can't depend on their money to save them. That's right. So from the church of Laodicea, we learn some things. We learn that remember let me let me share this with you. Laodicea, you remember what it means? Remember what that name means, Laodicea? The rights of the people. We've never lived in a day and age when everybody wants their own rights. Right. This group's got to have their rights. 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 This... All the way around the board, everybody's wanting to know. And everybody's rights are clashing. Mm -hmm. Everybody's rights are clashing. Yeah. That's a sign of the times. One of the signs of Marxism is to get everybody fighting and destroy, destroy the foundations that you had. Get everybody upset. Get everybody in the street. Get everybody right. What have we seen for the last three years in America? Every time something happens that, that somebody doesn't like, they start burning the streets down. I think I'll lock them all up. Amen. I think I'll lock them up, throw away the key, and not let them out. Right. Yeah. You say, man, I don't think that. That doesn't sound very Christian. It sounds real Christian-like to me. It sounds to me like the exact thing to do. You don't just let you don't let people just criminals run them down the street, uh, uh, robbing and murdering and killing and hurting people. And just, this this had a police officer killed in Logan County, Mingo County, the other day. Did you hear about it? No. Yeah, got ambushed. Uh -oh. State police, the West Virginia State Police, ambushed him, shot him, and killed him. Now you don't ask me what they ought to do with that guy because you wouldn't like my answer. That's right. But we'll probably spend. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep them for 20 or 30 or 40 years right. locked up somewhere when we can solve that real fast. Amen. You say, surely you're not for capital. But well, the Bible is. Right. Yeah. The Bible is. There's just some things that, you know, if you're, going to, if you're going to do stuff like that, there's just some things you don't deserve to live. That's right. Give them a chance to be saved. If they don't want to be saved, say, we're pulling the switch on you, baby. Out of that's here. That's right. That's right. Now I know that's not very pleasant. People probably don't like that, but that's oh, listen, well. that's the reason that's the reason our jails are running over. Yes. Right. That's the reason why we don't that's the reason why we don't have we don't have jails to put criminals today. Yeah. Because we've got so many people in jail, we don't have we got so many criminals we don't have any place to do what and put them. Mm. You gotta have to do stuff like that. You shoot a, you shoot an officer. Mm. It ought to be mandatory. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. It ought to be mandatory. It'll be a mandatory death penalty. Yes. Right. 
ought to be mandatory. These guys, these guys right there, they got, they got a son that's a police officer. Amen. Out there risking his life every day. Every day risking their life. Giving their life so that you and I can have 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 freedom and have Amen. peace and, and be able to lay down at night. And then, then we want to somebody just go out there and take pop shots at them. No, no, I'm sorry. I got off on a rabbit trail there. I'm not sorry, but it's the truth. Amen. 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 So we learn from the Latter-day Saint Church that it's, a, it's the rights of the people. Mm. Right. I want to tell you something tonight. I've said this to you, and you've heard it said before. <coughs> right, maybe not from this pulpit, maybe from that one down the road. When you get saved, you don't have any rights. No. Mm. You surrender right. your Amen. rights to the Amen. Lord Jesus. That's right. And Amen. you become a bond slave to the Lord Jesus. That's you begin right. to serve Him. You don't pick all my rights, my rights. You don't have any rights. You don't have any rights. You, you, you give up and you give yourself to Jesus and you surrender to Him. Right. Wow. Jesus wants us to depend on Him. Right. He wants us to trust in Him. He wants yes. us to go with Him. Amen. Not the rights of the people. Right. BLM and CRT and all this. Uh, that's nothing but something to keep everybody stirred up. That's right. Yeah. Just keep everybody stirred up, keep you fighting each other. All the all this sexual stuff, all this genderism, all this alphabet stuff, all this pride stuff is nothing more than a ploy to keep you upset. Right. And right. keep you fighting. If you can fight each other, yeah. then they can eventually slip in the back door and take over. <laughs> and that's exactly what's happening. Amen. Amen. So we just need to learn to surrender. We don't want to be we don't want to be a prideful church. I think the worst thing in the world can happen when a church thinks, well, I don't need anything. Right. You know, that's what, there, there are a lot of young preachers like that today, by the way. I had a friend, I told this story, I'm going to tell it again. He's, he's a little bit older, older than me, but a good guy. Can preach, can teach, can sing, can soul wing, can visit, can do anything in the ministry that needs to be done. He's not pastor, and so he went to his pastor. After a young pastor and told, took him out to lunch, sat down with him across the table and said, you know, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that, I'd like to help you. What can I do to help you? What can I do to help you? The young preacher looked at him and said, nothing, I don't need your help. Mm -hmm. Honestly, when I retired in West Virginia and I thought I had gotten out of the ministry, you see how, how well that worked. I thought I'd got all I want to do is help some young, young preacher. You can't find young preachers to help. Mm -hmm. They know it all. They're, they got so much pride and arrogance about them that you can't help them. Mm -hmm. We listen. We all need help. Amen. 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 We all need help. Man, listen. If we had a house full of preachers. I'd be happy. Man, we had ten or fifteen preachers. I'd be happy. Amen. Man, we need help. Amen. We need every one of us needs help. Amen. And we don't be like the church of, of Laodicea and get to the point where say, well, you know, we, we're going to get to, we're going to just get to the point where we don't think we need anybody or anything. We get like that, we might as well shut the doors. Right. We might as well uh, uh, to, to take out that Freedom Baptist sign out there and put organization or club mm. because that's what we've become. Mm. The church of Laodicea got so indifferent. Remember, Jesus said, I'd rather you be cold or hot. Man, if you're hot, you do something. If you're cold, you can get warm. You can get hot. <laughs> but he said, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out. Amen. The Laodicean church today is going to be spewed out. It's being spewed out mm -hmm. by the Lord Jesus. He's not going to use the Laodicean church. But he did say, remember what he did say? He said, I stand at the door and knock. Yeah. Yeah. If any man, listen, the church, the church in this day and age, for the most part, is, has gone to the dogs. Right. There's a few spots, there's a few places that still preach and still still want the power of the Lord, still love people, still want to see people saved, and still tell people about it. For a lot of them, that's just it's, it's nothing but a social money making machine. Amen. But Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. Yep. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in there. Amen. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that even in a day and Amen. age of, of what we're living? That we have the opportunity to see people saved. That we have a chance to be, what, Susan and Rowdy there just got saved. Isn't it, isn't it great that we've got the opportunity to see people saved? Amen. Amen. I mean, think about that. That God is still, he's, God loves people. Amen. Jesus loves people. Amen. For God so loved the world. Yes. 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you. Amen. But listen, God doesn't talk. There's a, there's a, remember what I said the other day? The, the, those angelic beings, those created beings that God has got around the throne, the cherubims and the seraphims, were crying around the throne in Isaiah chapter number 6 in the book of Revelation. Holy, holy, holy. God is a holy God. Amen. Amen. Because he's a holy God, he does listen, his nature, his characteristic, listen, there's a judgment and a justice side of God. Just as much as there's a love side of God, there's a judgment and a justice Amen. side of God. Amen. Just as much as there's a heaven, there's a hell. Just as much as there's a right, there's a wrong. Yeah. And we can't we can't lose sight of that and get caught up into this fluffy stuff, fluffy stuff, this cotton candy stuff, man. Just everybody's okay and everybody's going to heaven. They're not. not People right. will wake up in hell, man. It's going to be too late. Right. It's going to be too late once they die and go beyond the portals of this side and wake up in hell is too late to get them out. Right. It's too right. late to repent. It's too late to pray. It's too late to bang. It's too late to believe. It's too late. Yes. Right. We must be the church. We must be the church that still believes in the love of God. We must be the church that also preaches on the judgment of God. We must be a church that preaches on the holiness of God. We must be a church that preaches on heaven and, and preaches on hell and preaches on sin and preaches on right living because if we don't, we're not doing what God would want us to do. Right. It's a deception. Amen. And it's a lie of the devil and this cultural movement as I said, hell, everybody, wouldn't that make any difference? You're just going to heaven. Do you realize... Do you realize what that does to Jesus Christ? If you listen, if baptism doesn't save you. Amen. Right. Church membership doesn't no. save you. Amen. Taking communion doesn't save you. Amen. The only thing that saves you is when you call on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To Amen. save you, Amen. and you realize you're a poor, lost sinner on your way to hell, then you call on Jesus and He'll save you. Amen. Amen. Then you can be baptized. Then you can be a member of the church. Then you take. Then you do all those things. But you don't do those things to get saved. No. You do those things because you got saved. Amen. Right. But we got it all backwards today. We just tell by the one to heaven. You realize what Jesus went through on the cross of Calvary? Yes. The beating, the mocking, the shame, the spitting, the slapping, the cat of nine tails. History says that his back looked like raw hamburger meat. Yeah. Beaten 39 times. You know, you know, the Roman lost, you can't beat them 40, 40, 40 stripes to kill you, so only beat them 39. The cat of nine tails had bone and glass and metal and rocks tied into the into the ends of into those leather wraps as they beat him. And history says he beat him and him. His back was just opened up. Yes. That's right. And you would tell me that that wasn't enough to save you? Mm. Did it take something else to save you? Mm. Wow, the Bible says that if righteousness could have come by the law, it would have come by the law. Yeah. Right. Salvation could have come by the law, it would have come by the law. If getting to heaven could have come by the law, it would have come by the law. Jesus would never have left heaven and gone through what he did. Right. He, but he went through that on the cross at Calvary so we could be yes. saved. Amen. Please don't ever lose sight of that. Amen. So there's my seven, five, my thoughts on the seven churches right there. We don't get any internet. I'm going to go back and preach on each one of them again. I don't know. I like them. Miss Gina, let's get a song and stand tonight and let's sing. If you're here tonight, maybe you're unsaved. Maybe you're not where you ought to be. Maybe you need to rededicate. Maybe you just need to come and pray. Maybe it'd be a good time just bumping off and saying, God, help me to be what I need to be. Let's all stand, please. Thank you. 
Major, get the camera here when he finishes up. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the blessings that we have to gather, the freedom to praise you, O Lord. Uh, all our praise goes to you. Amen. We're so thankful for our souls that's been saved today. Yes. We're so thankful for the message today Amen. of the ch churches, the seven churches. And we pray that we can save more souls that we won't have to go beyond the rapture. And we pray that um, you'll remain in our hearts and keep our fire strong and help protect us from being deceived. Oh, Lord, there's so many things out there for the, the corrupt in our young now. Yes. Every home and that I can remember used to have the Ten Commandments in the home. Right. We lost it out of our schools. And they're just tearing away, Lord. They're just taking you out of everything here. Amen. And we want to try to protect that. So yes. please be with all of us as we go our separate ways yes. until we come back in your house once again. And I say all these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Rowdy Mash. What's going on, buddy? Rowdy Mash. Yeah. 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 Yeah.